invite you to pray with me. Loving God, as we live into this adventurous future that you have prepared for us, we pray that your spirit and your presence would lead us forward, that the glimpses that we have of your promises would sustain us, so that we might bear the light and message of Jesus until that day that you make all things new. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As he began his sermon for the Sunday morning worship service at annual conference, Brother Patrick Starkey, my predecessor here at Ninth Street, told of the story of one of his experiences from his time serving at Casa de Esperanza in Houston, Texas, while he was in Brethren Volunteer Service. It was near Christmas time, and the foster children that lived in the house that he and Susan served in, along with the other houses that made up that neighborhood of hope. Uh, for Casa de Esperanza was not merely one house, but many. Not all that unlike Hope Tree, if you've ever been over to visit Greg at Bledsoe House. And that evening, all of the children were gathered outside for a visit from Santa Claus. And so each of the children, in ways that were fully appropriate for their ages, had their eyes focused forward on the main event. As jolly old Saint Nick came bearing presents and saying, Ho, ho, ho to these children who had overcome so much in their young lives. All of the children were focused forward, that is, except for one little girl. Instead, her eyes noticed what was going on behind the houses. And so she pulled on Patrick's pants leg, pointing behind the houses and saying, Look! Over there! Look! Over there! And as Patrick turned and looked, he saw a forklift from the local building supply store, delivering a huge pallet of supplies. One pallet for each household. These pallets were piled high with canned foods and dry goods, diapers and lotion and other supplies that the foster children would need, supplies that would last for months on end, supplies that would enable the staff to lovingly tend to the children's needs. With eyes of curiosity, and ears attentive to the sounds going on around her, this little girl noticed what the others had missed. She noticed the true main event, the one that was going on just outside of the view from the stage. And because of her curiosity, she caught a glimpse beyond what was obvious and saw the real story of that evening. What that little girl noticed at the House of Hope is true of our faith in general. In a culture that values flashy displays of one-upmanship, the main event of the Gospel of Jesus Christ often escapes our notice. In a society that values more, more money, more people, more prestige, the most important seeds of the Gospel the seeds that lead us into God's adventurous future are all planted just outside of our view and just outside of the notice of those around us. Those important seeds of the kingdom rarely make the local or national news. And dare I say, they rarely make 
denominational or ecumenical news for that matter. But they are there. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear, to notice. For we, just like our ancient sisters and brothers, have been given a sneak peek into the promises of God, promises that reveal the future that the Lord our God already sees. We have been given a glimpse past the veil that separates heaven and earth, so that we might have what we need, to live into God's adventurous future, here in the present moment. Too often when we approach the book of Revelation, or when we approach the prospect of the days ahead, we lose ourselves into doom and gloom, into the foretelling of catastrophe and calamity yet to come. Biblically speaking, we can get so caught up in the obscure signs and symbols that God's revelation of Jesus, a revelation that John the Revelator tells us is the whole point of the book, almost becomes hidden in plain sight. Amid these signs of sin and judgment, it is easy to lose sight of the Lamb that was slain and rose again as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It is easy in this culture that values power and authority to miss the power of the one who chose to face death rather than bring death. And likewise, when we consider the future of the church, we can so easily get caught up in once, what once was and no longer is that we lose any sight that it was the same God who brought that past who promises to bring our future. The book of Revelation begins not with promises of catastrophe, but rather with the promise of God. It starts with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. In all of my study in Scripture, I don't believe there is a single book in the other 65 that begins with anywhere near as plain a statement of its purpose as that of Revelation. Its purpose is to reveal Jesus and through Him to reveal the promises of God to us. So revealing are these words that we are encouraged in verse 3 to read them aloud. Not only so that we will hear, but also so that we will keep the words that are found in this prophecy. Throughout the annual conference, in the plenary sessions, in the business, in the Bible studies, and in worship, we were encouraged again and again by preachers and officers, by study leaders, and by our sisters and brothers in Christ to keep our eyes fixed upon God's promises for the church in the future. And I must acknowledge that this can be especially challenging when we look at the immediate future and things do not seem so good. Numbers and offerings continue to decline. And the church has seemed to lack vision, vigor, direction, and passion. We are working hard, as hard or maybe even harder than ever before. But we seem to be getting nowhere and getting there rather quickly. But in keeping the future before us, God through the Holy Spirit is reminding us that this is not the first time in the history of the church that we have been faced with this type of situation. 
John received his vision while on the island of Patmos. And he told us why he was there. He wasn't there for vacation or for rest and relaxation. John was there because he had been banished to this small island on account of his testimony to Jesus Christ. John was on that island because he was being persecuted for his faith, a faith that we share. In the face of overwhel the overwhelming cultural supremacy of Rome, where Caesar was proclaimed to be the savior of the body politic and the lord of the earth, idolatrous claimed surely, John and his fellow believers had the audacity to proclaim that if we look just over there, just behind what everyone else sees. That if we look in this other direction, that we would see the one who has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us into a kingdom and priests on behalf of his God and Father. This type of future vision requires, brothers and sisters, that we not only believe the gospel message of Jesus Christ, but that we also commit ourselves to living that gospel day by day, moment by moment, and hour by hour. We have just finished an annual conference where we affirmed a vision that called us to be Jesus in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And John points to this call by speaking of his own sufferings. And John, speaking of his sufferings, demonstrates that this call to be Jesus in our neighborhood requires patient obedience in the same direction as Jesus over a long period of time. This patient obedience, the same obedience that led John the Revelator to Patmos, ultimately leads to steadfast endurance. But how do we endure in that patient obedience when everything around us seems to be falling apart? How do we strain forward into God's adventurous future when we are uneasy with the present and terrified that the church as we know it might cease to exist in the not-too-distant future? This patience and steadfastness comes not from our own strength of will. It comes not from our own intelligence, drive, or wisdom. It comes from nothing more and nothing less than the promises of the Lord our God, made manifest in our Lord Jesus the Christ. For after we wade through the scary stuff, after we wade through the scenes of death and destruction that make up the middle chapters of the, of the book of Revelation, after we see the glimpses of heavenly worship that take place alongside the judgment of the earth, John gives us a glimpse into that final ultimate goal of the Lord our God. As John concludes his vision, he testifies that he saw a new heaven and a new earth. As Brother Starkey noted, this new heaven and new earth is notable both for what is present, but also for what is absent. Absent from this new city is the sea which symbolically proclaims the absence from the kingdom of God of all that fearfully threatens to overwhelm us. Absent are tears, because the Lord our God has promised to wipe away every tear from our eyes, to bring healing to our pain, so that we need not suffer any longer. Absent most certainly is death and anything else that destroys life. But even more important than what is absent is what John sees that is present. 
What is present is the visible living presence of the Lord our God. No more will God be hidden from the eyes of humanity. No more will the ways and will of God be overwhelmed by the cultural forces of materialism, consumerism, and the violence that so often accompanies them. Instead, God's ways will reign supreme on earth as they do in heaven, as God makes all things new. John ends his vision with a simple promise that these words are trustworthy and true. To speak in modern cliche, we can take them to the bank. They're as good as gold. How would we live differently if we could see beyond the illusions to see what God is doing in our time and in this place? How would we serve differently if we knew with sure confidence that no matter what happens today or tomorrow or the next day, that in the end, in that goal, in God's new creation, that the way of Jesus prevails, finally and completely. Sisters and brothers, we don't need to ask ourselves how we would do if we had that glimpse. Because we have that glimpse. It is right here in front of us. In John's vision to the churches. Through John's vision we know what holds the future. And more importantly we know who holds that future. And it is not a mystery to us what the Lord our God is doing. We know that God is at work bringing about a new heaven and a new earth. We know that that work is already in progress. We know that our God is not sleeping, nor is He on vacation. We know that God is real and present and at work in our lives and in this world. We know that God promises to wipe away the tears from our eyes, to make His home among mortals, and to bring healing to the nations. And we also know, because God through John has told us, that the purpose of this vision is to supply God's people, to supply you and me and our brothers and sisters here in North America, our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, our brothers and sisters all around the world with what we need to follow Jesus through the trials and challenges of our time and our circumstances. We need not fear for the future of the church. Either the church of the brethren as a denomination, our local church as a congregation, or the church universal. Because God has showed us how the story ends. John has shown us that whatever happens to our local congregation, or to our small denomination, or to our sister and brother denominations around the world, that the church universal ultimately fulfills its mission. To bear the message of Jesus in this hurting world until God indeed makes all things new. We need not be tossed to and fro in the pursuit of more because God has given us what we need. We need not cling to what has always been because God promises that through patient obedience He will make us adaptable, innovative, and fearless. And so as we live into this adventurous future that God is calling us into, let us go forth trusting that while we may not know exactly what will be around the next bend, we may not know exactly what will happen next month or next year or ten years from now, we do know what God is up to. We do know what God is working towards and straining towards. And so as we wait for that full and final fulfillment of God's promise, 
Let us live in to John the Revelator's vision with lives of patient obedience and enduring faith in the meantime. Trusting that in joining with God's work that is already in progress, we are fulfilling the mission that the Lord our God has given to His church to bear the light and message of Jesus to each other, to our neighborhood, and to this blessed and broken world. Amen.